off. So I'm really, really, really excited um, to have uh, Richard, Richard on the call today. Richard is uh, just total badass. So we're gonna, we're gonna get into him in just a second, but just to set the table for today. So I'm Pete Senna, for those of you that don't know me, um, this is 444. 444 is a series that I recently launched where um, I'm just having cool and interesting people that I know, and I'm blessed and lucky that I have a lot of those in my network. So I figured, why should I afford all the good conversations since I've got good people? So I figured I'd bring everybody together. So if you're interested in being a guest on a future episode, um, definitely shoot me a note or shoot Kyle a note. Kyle's the, the awesome guy who got you the invite for today. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, Richard, thanks again for making the time. I know you're doing lots of little things. You're, yes, you're in the studio with the blue background, which we'll get into in just a second. Yeah, yeah I'm in my own blue screen. Awesome. You're literally in your own blue screen. So um, I'm going to get right into it today. So uh, just a reminder to folks, uh, we will be using the screen share feature. So if you're dialed in, you'll want to be in front of a computer. Um, this is going to be fairly interactive today, but we're going to get into some really nerdy conversations. So um, if you're on, we'll, we'll take questions later in the discussion. But the first thing I want to do is just have everybody go to their uh, chat window in Zoom. I'd like to just start with a really quick warm-up exercise just to kind of kick things off. So since we're talking about stories today, specifically AI-driven storytelling, um, one of the things that I'm a big avid reader, I know we've got a lot of, lot of avid readers in the call today, so I know some of you guys personally. So I just would love to start with a quick warm-up. What's a book or a talk that you've read recently uh, that's changed the way you think? So I'm just going to give us a quick 60, 60 seconds just to give it a thought and just pop it in the chat, the name of the book and, you know, why it is that you chose that. Um, something that changed the way you think or are thinking about things. Now I'm gonna put dance monkey on while we do this because that's what I feel like in being these things. It's like a monkey dancing, so. You have to fast. This is awesome. I love it. Just fast and furious. Awesome. Keep it flowing. Thanks so much for that, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm going to call some of those out loud. Um, and Alyssa from our, from our creative strategy team is going to be popping some of these here, uh, here as well on the board. So we do this thing called conversation coasters. So hopefully um, when we are able to, to meet in uh, fairly close proximity and, and wherever the world ends up, um, we'd love to be able to play this game with you in person. Uh, we do a thing called conversation coasters, as you see here in the picture. It's basically just drawing a card at random. So that was just a, a random one I drew here um, from the coaster's perspective to get that question. But it just kind of keeps the conversations going. Quick little icebreaker. Um, so it's interesting to do it in a visual format and a digital format here. So um, I'm a huge uh, believer that leaders are learners. And I think that everybody can be a leader. So that, I'm really glad that you guys are uh, clearly leaders. I see a lot of really awesome books. Liminal Thinking from Dave Gray. Ego is the Enemy from Ryan Holiday, uh, Shoe Dog Phil Knight, just incredible memoir book on Nike and that story. So really great books. Again, I will share this at the end. So I've been doing these sort of live sketch notes. Um, we'll definitely post this on my Twitter after today. Um, but really just let's get right into it. So today's guest, um, an hour is going to fly by super quick. Um, usually we schedule these things for an hour and I feel like they, they just go on and on and on. So no worries at all. If you have to jump right at five o'clock, I will not be offended. And I'm sure Richard going as well. Um, but first, just want to kind of talk a little bit about Richard and um, kind of talk to you about just who you are and your background. But the first thing I want to dive into is what the hell is a mythologist? <laughs> yeah, I, that's one of the, the, the my favorite questions. Um, I even I even at one point had more fun with it. I started um, playing with a narrative of I like to play with narratives and I'm think of the world as being just immersed in narratives. So when people are telling me things, I frequently hear narratives or I see stories. Um, and then uh, if you know that similar narratives, you kind of know kind of where, what the options are. 
Um, and at one point I remember mixing up the mythologist uh, element uh, with by changing it to mythological consultant, which made people uh, ask me if I was real or not, which was really fun. Um, <laughs> like, are you a real consultant? And I was like, yeah, it's about the same as all the others. Um, but so <laughs> ultimately the, um, the, the question that of mythologist or mythology has changed a lot. Um, in the last hundred years, mythologist meant someone who studied primarily, you know, um, ancient stories, usually from uh, Greece or Rome, uh, at least in Western civilization. That's kind of like when you hang out with your buddy from New Jersey who says that the only good pizza is from New Jersey and won't eat any pizza from anywhere else. Well, you know, there is a Chicago deep dish, I'm just saying. So ultimately, I'm very uh, much of an advocate of looking at stories and, and, and myths from all around. But ultimately, the, you know, with the advent of, of the most, you know, more recent decades, the story of how people look at mythology has more to do with uh, what is the most meaningful thing? You know, what are the things that are the most meaningful? And how do they work with us? How do they work against us? Uh, how is it that our own, in, you know, our own brain thinks partially this way? You know, that's awesome. Um, I, remember, I remember, Richard, when I first met you, one of the things that really struck me, I mean, lots of things about you struck me when I first met you at, at Pat's uh, Primal Live event, uh, where Joe and I met you. But I think the thing that really struck me was that as a computer scientist, you, you know, doing engineering, doing coding in multiple different languages, you were also had all this deep understanding of story and the human experience, the human existence. And, you know, as an engineer myself, I, you know, I didn't really start paying attention to humans until maybe about 10 years ago. So most of my career was like staring at terminal screens and writing code. So I'd love to just understand and share with the audience a bit. Um, how'd you go from like, tell us a little bit about your story and like how you got into it before we start jumping into like worlds within worlds and AI, you know, that, that quote that I think a lot of people commented on when they, they reached out to me privately about the invite today was you said stories, the operating system of human consciousness. So like that was like, the most badass headline I think I've read in a long time. So like explain it, damn it. All right. So when I was uh, younger, I was really, you know, excited about computer stuff because I was nerdy and not that I'm not still, but ultimately what happened when I got into university and studying uh, computers was that they, they, they managed to take a lot of the fun out of it and that kind of sucked. Uh, but so what I found that, also, when I got to college was that I was a horrible student. <laughs> I kind of, you know, breezed through a little bit too much of high school. And then I actually had to think about, you know, how do I learn and, and how do I remember things? And then I realized that the weirder and the stranger and the more interesting I can mix an idea with, even if it's something like a grocery list. And I want to remember, you know, five random things. If you do any study in the memory courses, they'll tell you just, you know, imagine you know john travolta riding on a you know a big dog carrying a you know juggling eggs with a sombrero and you got you know whatever <laughs> your mental glue is there and but the idea is that the weirder the image the better it sticks in your head and so because i was looking at computers and i was thinking well it's like you know if we copy a file it's the same file but if you're trying to talk to someone it's never <laughs> never going to land the way you know that you might think um, and then I was also doing a lot of teaching. So they used to hire um, at Syracuse, they hired the under uh, undergrads to teach the freshmen. Uh, and that's had to do with in the 90s, a lot of the uh, thicker accents from the grad students who were from other countries and sometimes English wasn't their first language. So um, they found that for, especially for the freshmen, they'd hire the undergrads and it seemed to work a little, a little better. So I would have to explain these really crazy ideas. And I found that there wasn't an idea that someone couldn't understand. I, I, don't, I don't believe that there's an idea that someone can't understand if you have the right metaphor. And usually it has to do with the relationship of the thing in it. You know, if you can erase all the names and you really get at the essence of what's the relationship between these things. And then you realize that, you know, uh, a, a electrical circuit is similar to going down a slide at a playground, right? And then you then you get really excited because you come up with this metaphor and you're like, start telling all the, all your students that. And then in comes, you know, when your students who's from Ghana and he didn't have playgrounds <laughs> growing up. So now you have to think, well, what's a better metaphor for that? So it's really kind of where I, I got into it. And at the time I was also having a lot of uh, individuation, a lot of kind of my own epiphanies, my own questions of like, who am I? 
you know, what do I want out of, out of my life? You know, what do I want to kind of see before I die in a way? And a lot of it started to, I began to realize that if you want to really talk to people about ideas, you're going to, you want to kind of have a story to utilize that. And it has to do with the way the, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere work uh, in tandem and then together. Um, I mean, you can remember lots of things. I remember one of the examples that someone asked me, and they said, you know, what's the kind of example is, I can't tell you what I learned in third grade, although I know I spent over you know, almost 200 days at least there. Maybe I can remember a couple of, a handful of things. I can't remember what, what I learned in, you know, around then, but I do know that around that time, I probably learned as much as I could about the Ninja Turtles, and I could, to this day, tell you <laughs> all about samurai swords and different you know nunchucks and all those sorts of things and so I got really kind of interested in how me, you know mental glue works and that's where I got into the kind of this weird dichotomy between you know math versus myth and how these things are everywhere you know you, you have mathematicians always arguing well you can find math in anything right but the dilemma is that it's a lot of it's not meaningful you know unless you find a way to apply it unless you find a way to to bring it into meaning and being practical. That's super interesting, Richard. I mean, the thing that, that I'm going to sort of take you, take the audience to now is, you know, I know Sto Story Seeds has been sort of a, a labor of love um, you know, in the consulting work that you've done and, and just how you're sort of understanding language and meaning and, and making meaning from it. You know, I'd love just for the audience that might not be aware of it. I know I see some marketers here, some engineers here, so really eclectic group. Um, I'd love to just kind of, take a step deeper and help us understand some of these big constructs that I think cross over into multiple different industries. So I think about, you know, Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell, and, you know, these are foundations and folks that you sort of worked with people that are connected to their legacies and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously in marketing and branding, we use uh, archetypes quite a bit to help to, um, you know, identify and make decisions as to, you know, who we're communicating with and how we're going to communicate um, for those of you that haven't seen these types of things, I've got them here on the screen. You know, you, you might have heard, you know, the ruler, the creator, the, the hero, right? And seen sort of these different brand references or brand archetypes as they're, they're often referred to. Um, or maybe if you've been interested in, you know, TV or storytelling, you might have heard of the concept of the hero's journey, uh, really made famous by um, a guy named Joseph Campbell. So can you talk a little bit about just the experience you had at a high level with just working with these these foundations and these institutes, because from what I learned from you, Richard, was that when you started getting exposed to these things and then putting that through, you know, computational analysis, you know, as a programmer, you started to really take off with just the problems you were able to solve, everything from children yeah. to prisoners. So take yeah. us through that. Help us understand that because they don't have the benefit that I do of knowing you. Well, so one of the things that happened around, you know, obviously in the last hundred years is, you know, you first had Freud and Freud was uh, one of the, I mean, it's not that people didn't talk about the unconscious mind prior to Freud. I mean, people were, he had Mesmer doing stuff as far back as around what, 1776 or something, because he's hanging out with Ben Franklin and then people started hypnotizing each other and operating on each other all through the 1800s and having fun ripping out spleens and all that um, without pain. Uh, because I guess 1800s. Anyways, the point though is that once you get Freud in there, he starts to build structure to the unconscious. He starts to stop treating it like this mysterious, you know, thing. He kind of peers into it and he starts kind of trying to identify parts of it, whether that's the the ego or the id, right, um, or the super ego or different, you know, components. Then his understudy Jung um, had a little bit of a frustrated point where he was saying, well, maybe the unconscious isn't just a reservoir of sexual repression, or is it just a reservoir of kind of primal instinct? You know, maybe, maybe there's a spiritual component to it. Maybe there's a soulful component to it that has wisdom in it. Uh, and of course, that's where they went their different ways, uh, which is, you know, they make movies about that with Viggo Mortensen and, and such. <laughs> but, um, which is, you know, you know, it's, that's how that's how things played out but ultimately what happens is that you know Jung is Jung comes along and he says well you know what if what if there's like you know wisdom in things so for example he he at one point got mega obsessed with this dream that he had he had this dream about alchemy and alchemy of course is people turning lead into gold right 
but of course he's sitting there and he's saying, well, I can't take this literally. The unconscious mind might be looking at this as a symbol. So what is lead a symbol for? What is gold a symbol for? And then he got to this kind of conclusion, which of course he's a therapist, so he might you know, be a little leaning on this uh, notion, but that lead is symbolic of depression and gold is symbolic of true life and like being alive and being who you are. Uh, and so he started getting really, really like dorking out on alchemy books. And then he came up with this thing called, you know, the four functions of consciousness. And he said, some people are thinkers and some people are feelers and some people are, you know, sensates, they're very tactile people, they're, you know, five senses. And some people are intuitives, they look at patterns between things. And then he said, and then there might be introverts and extroverts. And pretty soon, we, you know, we had the Myers-Briggs system, which, you know, Hewlett Packard was having people with name tags in the 80s of their, you know, their, their Myers-Briggs topology. But most people don't realize that it goes back to the Aristotle saying there's fire people and there's water people, there's earth people and there's air people, right? Uh, so, so Jung was kind of in this, this boat where he was very, he started off being very scientific, but as he grew older, he became more and more kind of spiritual. He got kind of like into like Ram Dass territory by the end, uh, although he was a bit darker. He, um, he did not have a positive outlook of humanity by the end of his life. He actually was uh, kind of, kind of cross in some ways, but then again, it was World War II was happening. So, um, so, just happened. Super interesting. And I, again, I think the, the big takeaway that, that I want the audience to really to walk away from is that this idea that sometimes understanding the origin stories and how things break down, you know, I feel like we sort of live in this world, you know, as coders, we live in this world of syntactical sugar, right, where everything is abstracted to a point of just, you know, simplicity. Um, but I think that a lot of people don't necessarily go back to some of the origin stories. And, the, and I, I say that because, you know, what I'm particularly interested in is why do you think that we're still to this day using archetypes and branding and businesses and storytelling like like what is it about like because if i was to ask someone about like you know carl young like a lot of people just look at me and they blank out like what are you talking about right and then i and then i try, and then i say oh maybe is, is it carl jung let me like try the pronunciation different and they no, still it's look young. at me it's young. yeah no, no i i, I know yeah. that right? so, <laughs> but what's interesting is like you know we get paid lots and lots of money to help people figure out what their brand ar archetype is, right? So like, why do you think brand, ar brand archetypes or archetypes in general are important still to this day? I'd love your thoughts on that. Well, so, and this is, this is one of the things that's kind of crazy about it. And this is why I specifically will use the word unconscious rather than subconscious. To me, you know, what you say in language is important and the word subconscious means, oh, it's just beneath me. You know, I'm above it, I'm in control, which I don't see as being true for a lot of people. Um, and <laughs> myself included, you know, there's all moments where we just are like, wow, I'm kind of a crazy monkey doing weird things. Um, and, but the idea is that if the unconscious mind has patterns in it and it has kind of things in it that, you know, work, um, this is, you know, this is what, uh, you know, people call, um, uh, like primary metaphor. I'm, tr I'm blanking on the guy's name that does all the, uh, Lakoff, sorry. So Lakoff talks a lot about, um, uh, primary metaphor. So for example, um, he said, you know, say there was a family of snow, snow people, a snow mommy, a snow daddy, and a snow baby, right? And they go out and play in the snow, and they have a great time, and they have a, a, a fight with snowballs, and they throw, make snow angels, they have a little fort, and then they go inside, and the little snow baby's tired, so they put the snow baby in the snow bed, and they take the big blanket of snow to put over the snow baby, so the snow baby's nice and safe and cold, right? Like a lot of people will have almost a visceral reaction if you say nice and safe and cold. Um, it logically makes sense, but the idea is that in our brain, there's different um, neurons. And when a baby is being held, when we were all being held when we were little, we felt one neuron say, I feel warmth. And another one says, I feel safe. And then these two kept firing at the same time until they kind of web and mesh together, right? And that's our current understanding of kind of how this plays in. When you, to answer your question, how do these archetypes kind of keep building up and coming up, right? Well, we're not exactly sure, but it seems to be that because our ancestors spent so much time thinking about a lot of these things that we've inherited a lot of it. So whether or not you think about, okay, there's the four functions, you know, these got thinking and feeling and intuition and sensation, right? Well, but then you start watching a film like The Wizard of Oz and you realize that there's a character who is not thinking, but he's the absence of thinking. He 
needs his brain as the scarecrow, right? And you have one that has an absence of a heart and you have one that's afraid of being physically injured, which is sensation. And then, well, where's the third one? Oh, look, she's got a little dog. It's Toto and he pulls the curtain back because he's intuition. He knows that the wizard's, you know, a fraud. He does he knows the balloon's not going anywhere. He jumps out, you know. And then you start to realize that for whatever reason, these kind of things keep popping up again and again. You can interpret the Wizard of Oz that way. You can interpret the Breakfast Club that way. You've got four main characters, whether it's physical, like a jock or thinking like a nerd. You also have the nothing in that one. So that one's got a five element one. It's kind of fun. Or you could do it with lots of other ones. You could do it with the four you know, houses of Hogwarts and Harry Potter. You can do it with the four kids in the Narnia series. You can do it with the four Ninja Turtles, like I kind of mentioned prior. Um, the four main characters in Requiem for a Dream, you can interpret. There's usually someone who has something to do with thinking, or they might have where it's positive or negative. They might lose their mind, right, in Requiem for a Dream, the, the mother, for example. Of course. You know. And then the, the physical and these for, for whatever reason, I, and I'm, and I'm completely convinced that, 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 you know, it's not like JK Rowling's like, I will make the four houses of Hogwarts based on the four functions of God. It, it doesn't happen like that. It just kind of, oops, you know, pops in there. And for whatever reason, it just keeps continually doing this. So that's where I'm really kind of curious about what that kind of raw, having your finger on that raw pulse and getting a sense of where that's where that is getting a sense of what's really kind of coming out for people uh when they're really really caught in this thing and kind of getting it to a sense of all right well now you know what what are what is this narrative that we're working with you can go however to the east and they don't have four uh they don't have you know four elements the same way we do in the west you know in, in China and Japan, they frequently have five elements. In India, they have three. Um, you know, and if you looked at Ayurveda, for example, they have sure. Three. You know, but it kind of be, is interesting because you start to see these patterns pop up and again and again, and then you realize that this is the thing that, for whatever reason, clicks with people and motivates people in a weird way. I love that, and I think you know what what shows up for me in that is you know a lot of times you know Steve Jobs is famous for saying you know if you ask a creative you know, how they do what they do. They just do, right? Just creativity, just connecting things, right? Yeah. It almost sounds simplistic, but what I think is interesting about these archetypes and, you know, James who runs our story practice at the Digital Surgeons and, and different people on our team, you know, we use these archetypes as sort of ways to easily label, bucket, and sort out customers or consumers, right? So by being able to play off these basic patterns or these loops, essentially, we're essentially just classifying what types of stories we can throw at these people that we know are going to, yeah tried and true. So as marketers, I think, you know, we like to think we're behavior experts, but really what we're sort of just doing is kind of like cheating people to take the action we want them to take. Right. Yeah. And I say that like not in a facetious or negative way, but I, I zoom out on that because I think, you know, there's so many parallels between Campbell and Young for me in terms of just like this idea of plotting a cyclical journey, which makes me think and get into the sort of meat of today's discussion, which is AI driven storytelling, right? So we know where storytelling comes from, you know, it goes back to, you know, when we were, you know, seemingly before a campfire, right? You know, in our more primal times, right? But I, I, I'm sort of interested to understand, like, you know, I was talking to Andy Greenwald, one of our 444s about, you know, leveraging language to be able to understand and make meaning from things. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a, someone who's really interested in AI, I mean, you're literally in a room right now that's painted that color because you've been doing 3d scanning. Yeah. So like, what is it about 3d scanning that, that, um, has started to like get you thinking about where stories and AI and objects come together? Cause I want to start going deep down the rabbit hole. All right. Right All right. So let me, let me connect this and I'm going to hit on Campbell real quick because I kind of glossed around that. Campbell was one of Jung's kind of students. -ish. They met, they hung out, but you know, he just mainly read a lot of his books. But Campbell was an English professor, you know, in the Sarah Lawrence, who was just really, really interested in, in myth and story. Um, and then he started, he, he really liked Jung, he really liked James Joyce, even though Jung and James Joyce met and they didn't like each other. Um, but anyways, he came up with this notion of, well, you know, what if there is one story that's in us all? You know, what if there is this kind of connective tissue of these stories that kind of live in us, but they're kind of like fractal or prisms, right? And so then he started to put down what's called the hero's journey, although he didn't call it the hero's journey. He called it the monomyth, the one story, right? And he wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which, um, you know, it's fairly classic. And then some college kid read it and he thought that was kind of a cool idea. And he said, let me try to make a movie out of this. 
and so he, you know, made a movie, uh, and it was called Star Wars. It did okay. But um, ultimately, after that, everyone was like, all right, well, how do I make Star Wars again? And then the problem is that Campbell saw, you know, these so many motifs. And motifs, I mean, it's like listening to a song too many times. Like, if you hear the same song over and over, it's like the meaning drains away. You know, our brain has has been taught to not, you know, get into this space where it's contented with things because it needs to be recalibrating to different scenarios and different situations. So we ha we always have to keep things, you know, new and invented. So with Campbell, it's kind of interesting because he, you know, he, he actually never watched any movies. He stopped watching movies in the 20s <laughs> after like Douglas Fairbanks was on, you know, and he never saw any movies until like, he was like older. Uh, and then George Lucas started making him go to his house and watch movies, watch his movies. But um, what happens is that if you look at the different other people who have done motifs, like Campbell kind of set the hero's journey aside because in Russia, there was this guy 20 years prior named Vladimir Prop, who he sat there and he carved it. He car carved out like 30 or so motifs, but he's specifically Russian folklore motifs, but his are like crazy interconnected. And he's like, if you have this one, you're going to have this one and this one and that one. And if you're going to have this one, you're going to have this or that, you know, and his, his actually, he, he codified, he put little symbols on them. So they're really easy to program, right? You can make a, a computer kind of find patterns if you have the little symbols in the right order, right? You can, and there's people have done that. Uh, then, then you have another guy named Steph Thompson, and he created a you know a bunch of them. Uh, he or he created an index of about you know fifty thousand story patterns across you know, a couple million folk tales. He's, this his entire life, right? And so I got to a point with Campbell's stuff and with working with the people with Campbell where they were a lot of times repeating stuff that Campbell had said in his books or in his, his, you know, um, interviews. And I kind of wanted to push it further. I wanted to say, well, but what, you know, like you can't, you know, this is one of the dilemmas that Freud had was he said, Oh, everyone's living out Oedipus. And that could be him just kind of projecting that on other people. Like what if someone isn't, you know, what if someone has a different narrative? What if, you know, there's different, I mean, we all have different films that resonate with us. We have different stories that connect, you know, with us and that we, are really passionate about maybe that gives us an insight into who we are so i got more interested in that but at the same time to answer the question about the 3d scanning and ai uh, which by the way here i'm going to show you guys around the so if you look over here i've got an, a mannequin dressed as indiana jones there oops i'm tilting it the wrong way and then i've got one here and she's another mannequin and i got all these kind of 3d scanning systems here and this one's actually on a turntable so if you look she's spinning around right there um and and the re the reason for this <laughs> is i'm look i'm thinking about what the future of storytelling is right i have a student i've done a lot of mentoring too uh where you know my students will frequently um i mean one of the things that i love that campbell did say although he regretted saying it um but he had this phrase called follow your bliss you know kind of figure out the thing that makes you feel alive and do it uh, and then when he said it, everyone was so hedonistic about it that they, he said, I wish I had said, follow your blisters. Um, but so as a result, what I've kind of worked with, with kids mentoring is tell me what you care about, what, what are you passionate about? One of my students is really interested in cosplay and she wants to do cosplay. And so we've been doing <laughs> 3D. Well, this was the, this was the amazing uh, pivotal moment for her was she, when she wanted to make a Zelda costume. And she couldn't get the measurements for the, you know, the patterns right for her, for herself. She couldn't you know, do this sort of thing. Keep in mind, this is a kid that's in high school and she doesn't like math, right? So I figured out how to hack the game and pull the 3D model of the Zelda out of it, and then essentially convert the, you know, the measurements of the arm and and the tailored measurements from you know her to my student. So now I had a math equation for her. So if she wanted to make, you know, the shoulder pad for herself she just had to convert it out of Zelda inches into her inches and then she got really excited at the same time she got mad at me for tricking her into doing math uh, but again the the point is is that you know for me the idea is more the future of storytelling and I can see in the next few years with AI um, which by the way would after I did computer stuff in college I got a bit burnt out as a lot of people in the tech industry, I'm sure have. And so I took a break and I did a lot more of the story stuff, but the story stuff can be, you know, hit or miss, you know, you get a lot of requests, you might not for a while, it's kind of an unusual profession. Um, 
and so I've kind of done both of them, right? And then I got taken on as saying, hey, you know, people found out how kind of nutty I was. And then I got, you know, a gig being head of research and development for an AI company for the last few years. So I've gotten to the point where I've, I feel like I can train these little genies, right? I can train these weird little genies to, to do weird stuff. And based on that, I'm fairly certain within the next, you know, 10, 10 20 years, um, we'll probably have AI generated story that will kind of, um, I'm going to say tailor it to our own archetypes. Totally. They'll, they'll, they'll tailor it to, you know, what resonates for us. Now, of course they can't go overboard and, and give us, you know, all the, the dessert all the time because then we'll, we'll it's, it'll be frustrating. We won't want that. You know, we won't we don't want to be the king of the castle all the time. You have to have the kind of epic journey and the ups, the highs and the lows sort of thing. But right now the idea is how do we, create you know 3d characters how do we get and get ai thinking about the shapes of people how do you get an ai to recognize if the person's you know dresses indiana jones and the thing that's crazy with ai is that if you think about it like this right ai needs a lot of examples to learn something right so if i wanted to make an ai that can identify indiana jones <laughs> because i'm nerding out um, I can have it watch all the movies and I can have it watch maybe the old TV shows. Maybe I'd maybe, maybe I've only let it watch three out of the four movies because anyways, there's only three there, movies. There's yeah. only three of them. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, but the point is, is that you can have it where it can recognize a thing, but then sometimes it'll look at, you know, just a patch of, you know, dirt that similar colored and it'll get confused and it'll be like, that's, you know, that's him. I'm 90% sure. Um, so one of the things that's crazy about AI right now is that they found that if you kind of take the AI out of the real world and stick it in the imaginary fairy tale land and put it in kind of a video game and then train it in the video game, it'll get really, really smart because you have control over the video game. You don't have control. I mean, I can't go get Harrison Ford to go make some more movies. You know, if I had more of it, more of the movies and him, him running around in different angles and different lighting and things like that, you know, maybe a little slightly different costumes. You know, but if you get a, a dummy and you make a 3D model of it, and you stick it and you train the AI on that, it's called synthetic data. And so if you kind of, they found that if you train it on real data, it does so well. If you train it on the synthetic, it does so well. But if you mix the, the real and the, and the imaginary together, the AI all of a sudden get really smart. I mean, totally, that, that hybrid learning. Smart. No, I love that, Richard. That, that's great stuff that, you know, we've been doing a lot of work lately helping people figure out industry 4.0, right? So for those of you that, that aren't as, um, in the know as Richard is, you know, you think about like the four industrial revolutions, right? Obviously, you know, steam and water power being the first one, mass production and electrical power being the second one. The third one really is primarily the computer, IT systems and robotics. And now that fourth industrial revolution, which is really upon us, depending how you look at it, it's all the buzzwords that we all love to hate and hate to love, right? Blockchain, IoT, robots, cobots, machine learning, right? Um, but what I think is really interesting now, and we're going to start to get a little bit deeper into the sort of AI machine learning stuff is, you know, what I think is interesting is how, as Richard said, there's only so many stories and myths that these things all converge on, right? So part of what you did with Story Seeds, right, Richard, was you classified all of these things, all the different combinations and permutations, right? Well, I, I didn't class, that was Sith Thompson's stuff. So that was his, you know, his 70 years of life that I took and put into a day. I first I, first I proved it was in the public domain so I could get the database from a Russian folklorist <laughs> which was a wonderful adventure. And then after that I codified it and put it into, you know, a database system that would allow it so it was much more searchable, right? And then after that what I realized was well the dilemma with this stuff is the more, you know, text say I put in all the million folk tales. The problem with computers is like if it has a million records to look through it's 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 slower right because it has it has to go through all the records more and more and more right so the more stuff you give it it's slower they get kind of like the way the reason why i had to reinstall everything on my computer the other day um but so humans are different right the more stuff that we've been exposed to it's kind of like the sharper and the quicker we are right so that's where i kind of got into looking at different um database systems that would allow for it to be faster and it could you could play the kevin bacon game more you know it could be do the six you know degrees away and then cluster them and kind of weird you know shapes and things and then that yeah that made it so if people came up to me and you know said hey i'm looking for a story that has something about this this or that um i was really quick to be able to kind of pull something up 
you know, and find something that worked. And sometimes it resonated with them and sometimes it didn't, you know. Um, you know, I'm sure yeah. gone. in advertising, sometimes you can pitch to a client and it's seriously, it's like the most brilliant thing, right? It's and like everyone in the, in the room is like, oh, that's so cool. But like the one guy in charge is just like, I don't get it. <laughs> you know, and you're like, well, I can't help you. <laughs> you know well, that, that's why we just like we just scrape the things that they care about and we just find a way to weave it in back to something that they actually care about so we like you know th throw their idea out first and then for the other yeah after yeah that, let's, you know, i'm gonna i'm gonna have to ask you to give me a lesson on how to do that because i start dorking out so hard i'm like look i discovered this new thing you know <laughs> it sounds like a good use for hal right yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, i'll have i'll have you tell the group about hal in just a few but i, I yeah, want yeah. to just the parallel I want to draw, I know you got a lot of marketers on this call, and obviously, you know, storytelling and marketing is a big part of what, what I do in my day job. And, you know, what I think is really interesting right now, I'm doing a lot of work with a couple different companies, some of which are using AI, some of which are using language, some of which are using just classification in general to get smarter and make better decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what I think is interesting is take like the world of, you know, brands right now with, with everybody home with COVID, you know, e-commerce is soaring through the roof. So like all of our clients that do e-commerce or DTC and all the buzzwords around it, like they're booming, right? So now they're trying to go from like old school customer service, picking up the phone, you know, chat bots or text bots, which I think, you know, are getting better, but they're still kind of rudimentary and, and rever. Mm -hmm. I really love to see like the different brands. And this is pri primarily in Asia, you know, looking at companies like Soul Machines, mm -hmm. um, what they're doing, uh, which I'll come back to in just a second. But I think what's really interesting here, and I want to be clear for the audience, I'm not drawing the parallel between the four revolutions and the four here. So just likely your brain's doing that because mine just did, but they're, they're actually separate concepts here. Um, I think it's really interesting is what you were saying, Richard, around this idea of worlds within worlds, right? So you were talking about sort of dropping these AIs into things and going from there. But you know, what's getting me sort of interested a lot in this topic overall is like, how do we start thinking about this concept of, you know, digital twins, right? So a lot of companies, you know, in this sort of 4.0, they're doing lots of different things now with like, for example, we work with a client in the oil and gas industry, right? So they're literally creating these AI driven digital twins. You know, the airline industry has been known to do it with their jet engines. So where they're literally digitizing every aspect so that they can perform all these simulations. Now, we're, we're not going to go as far today to say, are we in a simulation? Because that could just get weird and I might lose 90% of the audience. But if you stick with me long enough, we might go there, guys. So just a warning. But I love what, what this guy, you know, has done at Soul Machines. I don't know. Have you come across his work yet? No, I haven't. I haven't seen this yet. Check out Soul Machines. It's really interesting. Um, they, they recently launched a kind of COVID helper avatar. But what I, what I thought was really interesting, I met him at a conference, um, really fascinating, um, kind of founder, visionary, um, done a lot of work in the film space and that sort of thing, but just creating these like digital characters that are AI driven. Yeah. Uh, there's been a couple of couple of brands recently that have actually done a really good job of this, where they, they have these influencer characters mm -hmm. that you can just interact with all day. So you think about like if you're a celebrity and you could create a digital twin of yourself that understands your voice, your tone, you know, has a body of 20 years worth of your uh, the things you've said and, and have done, and how you make decisions, and we classify all that. At that point, we're not sort of cloning consciousness, but that celebrity can do a whole lot more to be selling a whole lot more merch and they can be having thousands of conversations at the exact same time. It could be doing these Zoom meetings for us so we wouldn't actually have to be here. Amazing, right? Or who's <laughs> to say that we're not, who's to say it's not actually happening? The, um, but, well, the, thing, the thing that's kind of interesting about this is this kind of reminds me of, you know, when the internet came out it, in the 90s more so when like people really got on it and you know there were chat rooms and a lot of that sort of thing the thing that i noticed was a lot of people use that in order to explore the kind of intricacies of their own psyche you know um there was a lot of times where people would you know create um a character for themselves and this harkens back to one of jung's idea jung talked about the polytheism of the soul you know, this idea that we have all these different kind of characters and players inside of ourselves. And maybe when we were kids, you know, we're told, all right, you know, you're very, um, you know, you're like this. And so you develop the, that sort of stuff. You know, you might be told that, you know, you're, you're good at these things and you're not good at these things or you're allowed to do these stuff and you're, you shouldn't be, you know, should stay away from this, this other thing. Um, whether that's, you know, um, math and science or art or music or whatever sort of stuff, right? And, or being emotionally expressive or being motivated and achieving things or whatever, right? And so what happens is that 
it, in Jung's perspective is that the other part of your psyche is like ready to go, you know, like I'm, I'm personally colorblind. And so when I was, you know, in whatever grade I had an art teacher tell me, you know, you should probably not worry about art anymore. You should probably go study the other things, uh, which was really devastating because I really like to draw. And um, it took me years to get back to the point where I was like, well, I'm kind of underdeveloped in that kind of creative space, you know, in ways that I usually would find creative people and friends to work with. And then I'd let them kind of fill, um, fill that void a lot. But ultimately the, the thing that's, you know, that's tricky is when you're like, all right, I'm, you know, in my thirties, I'm going to start going to these <laughs> figure drawing classes or something. And you're like, I haven't drawn in you know 20 years. But, um, but the thing that's kind of interesting is so, when people in the early internet were trying to kind of explore this, it could go pause, it could go light, it could go dark, you know, there's a lot of people that go on the internet and then, you know, they troll, right? And that's not, I'm not saying that that's not real. The thing that's kind of crazy about it is that Jung talked about it, how important it is to express the shadow, you know, and they found that, that a lot of the, you know, the, the, the various per capita uh, statistics of, you know, horrible crimes has dropped over the last 20 years. You know, it might have risen all in all, but per capita, you know, it's, it's dropping. And so when you allow people to access the different parts of themselves and do that, then you can get into kind of an interesting space of that. Um, the other thing with this is, I don't know if I told, did I tell you about any of the stuff that I did with Toyota? No, but I think the group would love to hear about it for sure. Okay, so, so Toyota wanted to, I mean, it was, they're supposed to launch it over the 2020 Olympics, this was some years ago. And they were trying to figure out how to make an AI that was not annoying. <laughs> well, I mean, they didn't say that, but that was what I kind of heard. You know, it sounded like every time they tried to make this AI, it was like Clippy, you know, Microsoft Clippy. And it was just like, so in a, like just, in, just interruptive and annoying and just like, it's way too happy and too friendly all the time. And like, get away from me sort of, or, you know. Um, but what they wanted was they wanted to do um, an assessment of the archetypes behind AI and what are the possible archetypes that an AI could could utilize in order to have a self-driving car that people liked, right, and people worked with. Um, so one of the things that I told them was to essentially go through, you know, look at look at you know what is the per what is your user's narrative. So the first thing that AI should be able to do, it should, it should think of itself as a guide to help people into a new world where there's AI. So that's number one. And I said, and second thing it should do is it should ask them, what's, your, what's the story you think of when you think of AI? You know, so if it asks you, well, what movies do you think of when you think of AI? You know, and someone says The Matrix, it should behave differently than if they say Terminator or if they say Knight Rider, or if they say, you know, the Jetsons and like Rosie, or if they say Data from Star Trek, you know, because these are very, very different characters. Some of them are subservient, you know, Rosie is subservient, she's beneath us. You know, the machine is there to do my bidding, right? That's one kind of archetype. Another one is where the machine's in control and we're not, that's Terminator, you know, and that's why a lot of those narratives are horror stories. Sometimes they're on equal footing and that's data in Star Trek, right? So you kind of get into this, this element where, um, you know, I was essentially telling them to figure out, A, what, you know, what, how, res how receptive are people to the AI? Because you're going to have, you know, someone who is driving a car and maybe the AI has to stop them from driving because they're not driving well. You know, and it says, hey, I'm going to take over driving now. Well, if my car did that to me and I've been driving for so long, I'd be pretty pissed off. If I was a 16 year old learning how to drive right now, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> you know. I'm going to start texting. Because, yeah, yeah, take you know, over. Totally, totally fine. Or I might just let the thing drive the whole time, you know. And the thing that's going to be kind of interesting is that, but the, the other part that I told them was to not make the AI uh, monotheistic. I said the AI could pretend to be multiple people. And you could have the, the, the kind of uh, ornery rule-oriented car driver who is like, I follow the law and I do the speed limit sort of thing and that sort. But you could have a more creative radio who's like, oh, I'm going to play the most amazing music for you right now, okay? You know, don't worry, we'll get there in time sort of thing, you know? But like, and so even if someone is severely inebriated, they might be like, I hate you, steering wheel, but the radio, you're my buddy, I love you, put on some more, yeah, of, you know, whatever. And that was one of the things that I, I don't, I sometimes think maybe I shouldn't have told them that because it's kind of horrifying if you think of it, you know, but oh. ultimately it's, yeah, I mean, that was, that was the, you know, the main point. Sounds like a super awesome project. You know, the, the thing that that made me think of, we talk about kind of car companies or different companies, you know, one of the more recent things that, that I saw, this is just right at the end of April was when Travis Scott did the concert inside of Fortnite. 
you know, I thought that was just so interesting um, where you have these like activities now that are taking place in these virtual worlds and the, the, the sort of prominence of the virtual world actually has a higher value than the physical world, right? So, you know, I think about like brands in retail and, you know, the idea of scarcity, right? I remember years ago when we worked with Lady Gaga and did Gaga's workshop, it was like, you had to be the who's who to get into the building, right? Yeah. There was like that, that sort of barrier for entry. And we sort of took this idea of like, you know, the metaphor of the advent calendar, it took that online and, you know, we went a ton of awards for it and, and that sort of thing. But what I think is interesting modern day is like now you have these digital scarcity where you want to sort of get this skin for your character. Or you want to get this, unlock this, this thing because of, you know, the mask it lets you put on, right? And obviously masks is a big sort of young thing and, and, and that sort of thing. But yeah. I just think that it's super interesting to see, like for me, where my mind goes, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts of like, if you think about the, the, the concept of the MMO as a video game, which has been around for, you know, probably over 20 years, as, right? Mm -hmm. Help me out here, Joe, and that MMO has been around for about 20 years? Yep. Cool. So, you know, I think about Westworld and obviously like their newest season, I won't, no spoilers, don't worry, where they're doing sort of AIs and AIs and AIs fighting AIs. Um, I think about what HTC, you know, the HTC folks are doing right now with the sort of XR world. I don't know if you saw that, they just dropped that a couple of days ago, but What's interesting to me about these digital worlds is the, the way in which I think if done well, they have the ability not just to take over our attention, but their ability to sort of create the rest of that world. And one of uh, Corey on our team, one of our senior engineers and tech directors, he was, he was talking about this, I forget the name of it, Corey, definitely pop it in the chat if you could or jump on it's that some Japanese game that where the, it's just completely procedurally generated. Oh, uh, No Man's Sky. Yeah, th that's not a Japanese game, but yeah, everything is proce procedurally generated from some base code. I just assumed because it's an awesome video game that was Japanese. <laughs> that was that was gotcha. that was so uh, so uh, biased of me. So back to algorithms, right? But yeah, so Richard, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like you're doing a lot now with you're an expert on story. You're clearly an expert on AI. You know, your vision is to make AI more approachable to humans that don't have your level of technical acumen, right? Yeah, yeah. One of, one of my problems that I have with AI is that it's, it's very exclusive, right? And even inside of, I mean, being, being the head of R&D for an AI company after two years, having, you know, some person who comes in and just talks down to you like you're an idiot is kind of peculiar, but it happens. Um, and the thing that's kind of interesting about it is um, I've heard AI be described as the next fire, you know, and when you look at the mythology of fire and you get into this kind of space about thinking about imagine, you know, way back about 50,000 years ago when you had a group of people sitting there and they maybe they had never seen fire. And then this random guy comes, you know, or, or woman could have walked through and then, says, hey, I can, I can help you guys warm up and make the food taste a little better. And they pull out, you know, some, some stick and start spinning it sort of thing and sparks come out of it. And then all of a sudden they've got this weird, you know, thing that, you know, maybe you saw because of a forest fire once, you know, but then they say, here you go, you know, and keep that going. And that must have been like that person's a sorcerer, you know. And my own personal theory on this is that the it is, you know, if you look at the mythology, I frequently have to talk about Harry Potter, I, I have to, I get to, it's fun. Or, you know, when working with kids, I talk about Harry Potter and Gandalf and how, you know, those kind of are influencers and how Gandalf influenced Obi-Wan and all that. But the point being is that, you know, one of the main uh, symbols behind magicians is that they have a wand and then they have, you know, sparks coming out the end, right? Well, Gandalf Tolkien modeled specifically on Odin, okay? And in the original Germanic or, you know, uh, Teutonic or Norwegian narratives, Odin was blood brothers with Loki. Thor and Loki were brothers. Odin and Loki were in the original stories. And Loki was the god of fire, okay? If you look at the etymology of the word Odin, now Odin of was, at the time, he had Yggdrasil, which was this huge, you know, sacred tree that he was representative of, and it was this big oak tree, and it, they, you know, had at one point where there was a big oak tree somewhere and then some guy cut it down to prove that Odin wouldn't kill him, you know, and that's how they helped the Christianity to convert a lot of these people. The word Odin in German was Wotan and it is connected to the word wooden. 
Okay. So you take, you know, this, this prototype magician, Odin, and you take this oak, you know, spindle and you have this blood brother who is a trickster who's fire, but you also have to keep him around because, you know, even though he's annoying and he can, you know, burns everyone every so often, you know, you're in Norway, <laughs> you have to have these deities around, right? And they were both tricksters, actually, because it's a pain. I, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to make a friction fire. It's hugely a pain. Um, but so the point being is that, you know, with AI being this kind of similar fire, I'm very, very, very aware of that there's going to be people who can wield it, and they're going to be seen as magicians. And I think that the amount of power that these things have will be really, really, really problematic. You know, if, if you have either the people who know how to do it, wield it, or you have the Jeff Bezos or the, you know, the people who can pay everyone to, to do it for them, um, that's going to be problematic, you know. And so I'm very, very, um, very insistent on helping people to say, hey, you want me to make you, show you how to train the ants to kind of sort your stuff for you? You know, if you know Excel, I can do that really easily. Like I've got an AI that'll go into your Excel spreadsheet and it'll fill in all your data, your rows based on the ones that you filled in. It'll look at the other ones that are on, all done and it'll kind of say, hey, here's my best guess at these. You know, and the more rows you give it, the better, the more accurate it is. Um, you know, doing things like that, I'm very, very big proponent of. Uh, because if you get into fire mythology and you look at a lot of it, you also get into the, um, the genies, right? So the, the jinn of, the, of Persia, you know, so you had different types of jinn. There was marids and there was uh, jinns and jans and uh, shaitans, which is where the word Satan comes from, and ephrites, which were fire genies. Um, and the fire genies were especially very problematic. They were kind of monkey's paw genies, you know, half the time, you know, you might say, um, you know, hey, I'm, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of, of from the Arabian Nights. There's this fisherman who finds this bottle after fishing a bunch and he uncorks it and this huge genie pops out, right? And it's so huge that its head's up in the sky and in the clouds and its feet are at the bottom of the ocean. Aladdin. Um, it, yeah, it's similar, right? But here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the real version of it. By the way, in the, in the Arabian Nights, Aladdin is Chinese. So that's another fun one to toss. And there's two genies in the original story. But, um, but so yeah, so this, this huge genie's like, oh, I've been stuck in that bottle for 1600 years. And for the first 400 years, I thought, if anyone lets me out, I'm going to give them three wishes. But nobody came and let me out. So then the next 400 years, I thought, if anyone lets me out, I'll give them two wishes. But nobody came and let me out. So then the next 400 years, I thought, if anyone lets me out, I'll give them one wish. But nobody let me out. So the last 400 years, I figured, if anyone comes and lets me out of this bottle, I'm going to kill them. And you let me out of the bottle, so how do you want to die? <laughs> you know? And that, that's genie consciousness right there, because they're, they're symbolic of, of nature. They're symbolic of natural you know, currents and, and storms and ocean. And just, you know, they personified these things, and they tried, tried to get a sense of how these things behave. But uh, the, mo the monkey's paw thing happens all the time with AI. You're constantly trying to train it to do this one thing, and then it will monkey. It'll just blow up. It'll come up with the funniest, you know, funniest things. And so, the thing that we found worked really well with AI was making a little superhero team, where you had you know different ones that had their own little superpowers, but you put in like a Professor X or you know a Splinter or whoever you know in charge of the whole thing, uh, a Nick Fury or sort of thing, to Overwatch and kind of be like, yeah, you're, that's good, that's good, you know, and like you know, double check that they're not screwing up because man, they're really good at screwing up. Um, totally. I want to, I want to just pause you for one sec, Rich, because I know I only got you for a couple of minutes and I know you got a bunch going on. Um, I'd love to, to take some questions. I'm sure that if I know this audience, um, what are some things that you guys are working on right now that, that you'd love to sort of, you know, bounce off Richard's brain or anything that you heard today, you'd love for him to, to dive deeper into. Um, if you haven't realized he's a, masterful problem solver and he, and he has a number of different tools in his tool chest so with that um i would, I would love to uh sort of take some questions because i'm sure there's some folks that have some questions so feel free if you if you don't want to speak up you can just drop it in the chat or i will um and if you drop it in the chat or drop it in the chat for me in zoom I'll, I'll ask the question otherwise feel free to just just jump on now and just take yourself on mute Richard, hi, my name's Eric. Hey, Eric. Uh, so far, I loved all of this. I'm glad to have an opportunity to jump in. Um, in regards to AI uh, writing stories, mm -hmm. how 
do they deliver novelty? Uh, you know, surprises um, when they're learning off of these models. Mm -hmm. So the way that it works is, and so with, you know, generating text, um, the main player is called OpenGPT2 right now. Um, and that is one that will just, it, it's, it's kind of like a cluster of a lot of the different other, um, the other models, right? So what, one of the ones that came out a while ago was called like, uh, word vectorization and what they found was that if they said all right like say I took any sentence and I removed a word you know and then you had to guess what that word is based on the two the word ahead of it and the word behind it right um, that's one way of kind of making it learn because it would learn well based on this um, the, the the idea of word vectors is also saying kind of well let's weight all these words together Let's see which ones are this. And the, the crazy example that, that this thing mastered was this. So you could give it all these, you know, these stories. And then you could say, right, take the idea of a king and subtract man. And now add woman. And what do you have? And it'll say queen, right? Because of the weirdness of the relationships of the words in proximity to each other. So if you look at the relationship between king and man, and you look at the relationship, or, you know, he or et cetera, and you, put, you look at the relationship between queen and woman, these are these are in in kind of like they put it in this weird 3d space and then they, they they're you know it, it literally they can map that out with open gpt2 this is where you're starting to get people can make fake news really well people can make i mean i've trained open gpt2 to do i mean the, the default one is you give it all shakespeare's works and it'll just generate sonnets <laughs> that's the default that's the start off right uh then you can give it you know reddit quotes and have it just come up with reddit stuff i've seen people actually this is a funny one in on reddit the 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 people that were doing, you know, they have the different um, Myers-Briggs types, so the 16 different types, right? So the EF, um, TJs or whatever sort of thing. Sorry, EF, uh, sorry, it's it's ESFJ or something. And you could never, you could never have a F and a T at the same. Um, but so what they would do is they would have it predict what, what your type is based on the statement you made. And they got it to be 27% accurate, which is, sounds horrible, but it's way better than the 8% accurate that it should be if this thing was completely random. Right. So they were saying, oh, this might give some credence to these types actually existing. Um, but so ultimately to make it novel and to make it good, to even to make it make sense. Yeah, that's what people are trying to figure out. Right. And what I found is that a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll keep adding layers and layers and more. They'll, they'll complexify the, the AI. Right. And then the AI gets to a point where it's not just a black box. It's a huge black box. And so you got one or two people that can really get a sense of it. The way I would do it is I would say, all right, make an AI that generates stuff. Right. And then you make kind of another AI that would that would check on this. Right. Now, there is a famous form of AI called a GAN. It's called a generative adversarial network. And this really cool Canadian dude thought this up while he was drinking at a bar. And what he figured out was he said, and this is the ones if you guys have seen where it like will take a painting and, or a picture and repaint it to look like the Mona Lisa or like a Picasso. Have you seen that? Um, no. So what it does is you, it's like locking two immortal kids in a kitchen for you know, a million years. Uh, and one is going to cook the food and the other one's going to be the food critic, right? But you can only actually uh, blindfold. The, the trick is, is that the one creates all, whatever food and then the food critic gets blindfolded and it has to taste test from the one that it cr that the, the other AI created and then from actual real food. And it has to say which one was the real one. Mm. And so if, if the critic gets it wrong, then the critic gets, you know, slapped and the critic has to, you know, turn its twist its knobs and it has to learn. But if it gets it right, then it smacks the other little kid <laughs> and the other little kid has to cook better. And then the two of them evolve together like deer, you know, escaping wolves and wolves trying to get the deer and the two of them become majestic, right? And that's kind of how this works. But what we found works really, really well is just not keeping it at just those two. What I would do is I would come up with kind of the element of how is it that, um, you know, you might have an AI that, that does just generating ideas. You might have one that, that creates a kind of uh, core. Uh, the last time I had a, a conversation really deeply on this one, I had a couple little, not too long ago was with a VC and he was saying, well, you know, how do you, how do you model language? And I said, the problem isn't that they're modeling language. It's good. The problem is that nobody's trying to figure out how to model thought, mm. you know, and they're not figuring out how do I take thought of like, 
you know, turtle, pond, you know, breeze or something like that. And then it can say once a long time ago, there was a little turtle that lived in a pond and it liked to, it liked it when the breeze came and moved the reeds around. And then it wrote that sentence, a hundred different variations of that sentence, you know, and I said, so that's one of the ones that I'm playing with is trying to get it kind of in that level. Um, and then the other benefit is splitting up the AI into this little team is that you can evaluate which one's doing really, really well. And then you kind of have them kind of talk to each other. But, you know, a lot of like right now, the military, they don't like AI because they can't figure out how it's making the decisions and they want it to be accountable, which I guess might be a saving grace in a way. Well, it's the whole idea of like, um, you know, in order for certain mission critical systems to get approved, like it has to be explainable. Yeah. Right. So obviously in, in some cases, like the, in order for them to like sign off on it, right? Like if you look yeah. at like an SPSC grant or something like that, like they want it to be explainable. They want it to be deterministic. Yeah. They have all these like criteria that they're going after. Well, right? Don't get me on that soapbox, but. One of my favorite stories on that was, I think it was the, the Pentagon spent like huge ungodly amount of mo millions of dollars to train an AI to detect camouflage tanks. And so they gave it all these pictures of a tank that was camouflaged and they gave it all these pictures of just normal woods, right? And then it was 100% accurate. It couldn't tell you if there's a camouflage tank or not. And then they gave it to like the CIA or something and the CIA tried it out and they're like, this thing's like 50-50, this thing's horrible, you know? And they're like, no, no, it's great, you know, look. And then they showed it on their, they tried it on their own data and it worked. And the CIA said, yeah, but you took all the pictures of the camouflage tanks on a cloudy day and you took all the pictures of the of the normal forest on a sunny day. That thing just predicts the weather, <laughs> you know, like all it would do is be like, oh, it's sunny out, <laughs> you know, there's no tank, you know. And um, it's like it's like on Silicon Valley, if you've seen that show where it's like yeah. hot dog, not hot dog, <laughs> like there's so many interesting things. Um, that was great. I, I want to well, be respectful of your time, which is do you have a couple more minutes in case there's some other questions? Yeah, yeah, cool. I am. So um, thanks for asking the question, um, Eric. Does anybody else have any questions? I, otherwise, I want to answer some of the ones that have come in the chat to me. Uh, I have one question, if I can jump in, Pete. Yeah, please. What's up, Corey? Uh, hey, man. Um, thanks, Richard. Appreciate all this. This is awesome. So uh, working in tech, um, explaining things to non-technical people um, essentially defaults to metaphor for me. That's usually like my go-to way of trying to get um, people to understand um, those sort of uh, bits of information. Um, so the challenge you mentioned about trying to like personalize a metaphor uh, to someone specific or to make it like blend with something that makes sense in their mind or mm -hmm. trying to find that balance of how simple or how complex to make the metaphor to make it still kind of get that crux of the idea across. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice on like how you go about that? Because that's always a skill that I'm trying to level up. Um, yeah. It's something I am always using. Uh, first, I'd say give someone a choice, right? So like it's, I find, I find if I walk up to someone and I said, all right, um, pick, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Lord of the Rings, right? And the person's like, okay. And then they pick one of those, right? They can also say, no, I'm going to, you know, and then they, they have their own something else, right? But the idea is that now you've got kind of a working metaphor that they resonates with them. And as long as you kind of abandon your thing and then you're saying, all right, now I'm going to start talking through this until I can start to see where maybe these things exist, right? But usually the ideas, like I said, are, you know, uh, you kind of have to trust that they're in there. And you also have to trust that, that, that for whatever reason, they chose something that will help them to convey it, you know? And you, it's not, the, the, the honest is also, you know, not on you. Like you could not, you, it's not like you have to now think of the perfect metaphor for in this, you know, Star Wars universe or in the Lord of the Rings universe or the Harry Potter universe to, to help to articulate this you can turn it into a question and you can say, can you think of a time in one of in those stories where there was someone who was trying to do X, but then Y happened, you know? And then the idea is that first you're asked, you're starting off a tech conversation by asking them about something that's very not, te not very tech. And so what you've just done is you've tossed something really weird and interesting at them. Right. So now you're getting their attention, but also you're challenging them. You're giving them a call to adventure by saying, can you think of a time where something, you know, this, it does this, you know, and, and I find that that, you know, uh, that method works really well. If you let them kind of piece together the, 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 the pieces, one of my professors in computer engineering, when we were teaching, he said, he said, never answer a question with an answer. He said, answer a question with a question. I love that. And I, and I and I think of it as answer a question with a quest. Give them give them a quest of something that they can kind of get or something that they can achieve, even if it's 
pick a movie, you know, like pick or tell me, tell me what, you know, things you like to do sort of thing. But again, it has to be something you're familiar with. Uh, I've had, I've had the wonderful, wonderfully embarrassing experiences where I go in front of a crowd and I ask them what their mythology is. And then all of a sudden I have to talk about Twilight. <laughs> and I've never seen Twilight, you know, so I have to ask them what, tell me what Twilight is, you know, and then. I guess it's interesting. Was... It's interesting to say that. It's one thing I'd offer up for Corey. I pulled it up on the screen. I wrote an article like a couple of years ago, and I'm guessing you haven't had a chance to check it out, but um, it just come, came to mind is I, I got asked that same question by someone who was just getting in a role where they had a good strategy for our clients. Um, and I was really racking my brain and then thinking about like, what's the mental model and what's all the different stuff. And I was like racking my brain and the closest I got, I'd love to hear the, the group's thought on this, but like closest I've got was this sort of what I refer to as like the four corners of conversation, right? So coming from being more of an introvert, you know, I, I get machines more than I get people. And, and now I'm much more extroverted in the world that I have. It's a lot more, you know, customer facing and you know, on the front lines, if you will. And what I always say is like, the first thing is like building that context. So salespeople call that before, but for me, it's like building context on what are we talking about? And then trying to inject some type of a sort of dot connection of a relevant thing that matters to them. So like for me, like my team knows, like I, they've probably got their, you know, inside jokes on the different metaphors that I use all the time because they just, they're just true and tested. I've never like a whole bag of trick of them. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I, I have found successful in going into that is like understanding like where are we playing from and then figuring out like how to like loop through that. So like the thing that I found just getting back to Corey's question is like, if I can start to understand who they are, so rather than giving them a choice, I give them a choice without making it overt. Right. So if I'm in a room, you know, one of my favorite metaphors that um, Corey made one time was the, the idea of a flying car, which I, I still to this day love that metaphor, Corey, I'm sure you remember it. Um, let's, let's not say where it came from, but I remember the metaphor, but, but <laughs> needless to say, um, it was a great metaphor. And I think what I found is the more you understand about your audience, the more you can understand like how they look at reality and like, or how they establish their, their reality and then offer up that construct there. So like, mm -hmm. you know, generally, like if I'm talking to like people who are very spiritual, I'll, I'll use metaphors that incorporate, you know, like philosophy or spirituality, those things. Mm -hmm. If I'm talking to like some jock, you know, like person, I'm going to make a sports metaphor or something. So that's where I've had success. Um, specifically, I, I don't know if that's helpful for, for Corey or for the group, but yeah, no, I love, I love Richard's take on it. Sounds like a fun way. Has, has Aaron ever told you about the, the term pacing and leading that hypnotists use? He, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like, it's like, you just kind of try to like, you, you listen to people, but then you try to adopt the words that they're using and tell the, speak the words back to them as much as you can. Um, one of the other things too, Corey, that you're going to have in tech, I'm sure, is that a lot of times what will happen is you'll find yourself kind of uh, chained to a narrative. Uh, a lot of people in tech um, are stuck in the, the narrative of the wounded smith. Okay, and this is a this is a worldwide motif. So the wounded smith is a character who, like, I mean, examples might be like Hephaestus, the 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 Greek god of of smithing and and you know artisan craft work. Um, Regan uh, and the dra you know, Sigurd and the dragon. His mentor was Regan. Um, there's examples throughout places. But what happened was people were that were good at at creating you know machines and and especially weapons were so valuable that frequently they were not allowed to leave and they might get chained to their own machines or they might get their legs broken. And that's why Hephaestus had a limp, right? He had a broken leg. I mean, he got, he got that limp because he got thrown off Mount Olympus by Zeus, but that's, a, you know, what I'm saying is, 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 you know, in, in this kind of historic element. And so a lot of times with tech people, what happens is that people, they get treated like they're part of the machine and they get berated or they get treated like, oh God, I have to talk to the tech guy. Right. And so um, one of the things that's important is if you can upend that very quickly, you know, and 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 change that narrative, um, you can you can do that. I, I encourage people to utilize tricksterism as much as they can, especially early on to surprise other people to make it so that they kind of clean the slate of what their projected narratives are. Um, one of the things that's funny, I mean, I know a lot of you guys are in marketing, right, but I'm curious, does anyone know where the word marketing comes from? No. 
Yeah, it's one of those fun, fun ways to really tunnel into your mythology and start questioning where the words came from. So the word marketing came from the Greek god Mercury, or sorry, Roman god Mercury, Greek god Hermes. And he was the god of communication, and he was the god of market, and he was the god of thieves, and he was the god of lying <laughs> and trickery. Um, and he was the, I'm sure you've seen enough films where there's the straight-laced guy who's like the can-do guy. And then it frequently in, in the underdog stories with sports a lot of times. And then there's the other guy who's just like making fun of them left and right. And like, but then pulls, pulls some, some quick maneuvers and, you know, some, it's fun, very funny sort of thing. I'm blanking on examples, but I'm sure you guys are thinking of a couple of them. The only one that comes to mind is that, that old Arnold Schwarzenegger bodybuilding movie where he plays that kind of trickster role. Um, but anyway, so the idea though, is that, in marketing, if you're going into the room, well, you might have people projecting that that dark archetype of this person's a liar, this person's going to tell me what I want to hear, this person's, you know, got those things. That's not to say that tricksters don't have, in you know, they're endearing to us. We love tricksters in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, Coyote gets in trouble, but that doesn't mean he's not inventive. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have a role and he's not creative in a lot of ways too, you know, and helpful. And so if you're really, really kind of straightforward with, yeah, no, I'm the trickster guy and here's what's going to happen. I'm going to use my tricks for you rather than against you kind of in a way or demonstrate ways to do that. That might be useful. Um, again, the thing that's really crazy, there's some really, really, by the way, great work on the trickster. Um, Lewis Hyde has a book called Trickster Makes the World. Um, and then the, the other one that I love is called The Essential Crazy Wisdom by a guy named Wes Nisker. Um, and that one's about the trickster and it's not about the trickster with the idea of them being, you know, kind of like crude. It's also, you know, breaks the trickster into the clown, uh, the jester, the jester is the one who calls the king out on, you know, not wearing any clothes sort of thing. Um, and then the, um, the other two are the, the, the trickster, which is more the darker kind of, you know, one. And then the holy fool, the holy fool is kind of like Yoda. Right. And so if you can shift from the trickster narrative towards maybe a, a clown or jester, self-deprecation is a wonderful way of make, of building rapport with people. That's another uh, thing hypnotists do a lot. Um, but then also, um, if you get into that kind of holy fool space, you know, and the idea that Yoda is trying to convey is don't think you know what you're doing you know, come at this with eyes of wonder because I can't, I can't teach you if your brain's full, right? And that's a very kind of Eastern thing. So it'd be kind of interesting for marketers to adopt that narrative or find ways to shift from a, the dark. The reason why trickster is dark a lot of times in, in our culture, it has to do with Christianity. And Christianity didn't like a lot of the um, uh, kind of uh, the ribaldness of the pagan deities so they would frequently run across these deities and they were like oh man these things are, are messed you know uh but we have to vilify them and demonify them so that's where you have pan kind of turn it there's nowhere in the bible that that satan has goat you know goat horns or goat hooves they just took pan and they you know vilified him they loki it originally at the beginning he's just kind of you know, he's, he's like Bugs Bunny. He gets in trouble. He does dumb, you know, he does funny stuff. He's kind of witty here, there. I guess not as much Bugs Bunny. He's more kind of like, you know, uh, someone who tries really hard but screws up all the time, you know. Um, and then but by, by the end, he becomes much more of a villain, you know, and it shows kind of the Christian era coming in and, and re revamping it. But like Native American culture, trickster is very sacred. You know, it's a very good thing to have a trickster around. Uh, they're annoying to be around, but they have a culture that embraces that and embraces hardship and it says this for this is the person who's going to make you laugh when you want to cry you know and that's what they're for the thing i love about that richard is like you know just sort of zooming in or out of that depending on how you how you look at it i think you know I, I tell my team this all the time you know obviously coming from you know a design code background and now in this like more executive role and i get to hang out with cool people like you all the time the the thing i think is really interesting that i want my my you know more technical audience that watches this now or in the future uh, to really think about is just the way you've humanized a lot of the work that you do, right? So a lot of, you know, we could have sat there and we could have nerded out on like what Python packages that you're using to be able to do, you know, different analysis of, you know, emotion or inverse kinematics or those things. And that would be a super interesting conversation to probably 50% of the people that listen to this that have that background. What I think is really interesting about you and, and inspiring to me um, 
as I continue to try to just be relatable to people and understand where they're coming from, is just the importance of story, right? So just kind of coming really back around, it's like, you know, what I think is really interesting is the power that automation can have. So I'm going to take AI out of it for one second. We'll come back to that. And I definitely will. But like, the more we can automate the mundane, I think the more that we can leave room for play, whether that play be the trickster or that play be just connection. You know, I think marketing gets a bad name and I think it's because there's a lot of charlatans out there to your point, right? There's a lot of uh, people who are just looking to make a quick buck. You know, I think when marketers do their best work, when I've done my best work in, in that field, it's really acting as the guide and understanding that the audience, the customer is the hero. And just being that guide, whether it's the sage or the magician, whatever archetype you want to key into, to sort of take them there, right? Because there's nothing better than when you pop open your phone and you get that ad on Instagram or wherever you're, you're checking, you know, your social feeds, Reddit, whatever it is. And that ad is exactly the thing that you want to try. Like I just bought a lamp the other day. It's the coolest thing ever. Nothing more annoying than when Facebook's listening to my microphone and starts serving me ads about, you know, things that, you know, feminine products or things that I was talking about with someone that has nothing to do with me. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I, I literally the other day got an ad for Tampax because I was talking about, uh, it, an ad that was on the television that my wife and I were watching and we talked about it and then you get an ad with it. I'm like, no, this is not what we should be getting ads for. But I say that like in jest to say that I think that's something that engineers sometimes forget because we're so caught up in building the thing, the widget or the, this fascinating piece of code that we forget about the user. We forget about like, yeah. why are we building this thing in the first place? One of my biggest challenges that I face with my team, my clients right now is I feel like there are so many things that we can be making that don't require a single line of code, right? So to your point about fire being the next, you know, AI being the next fire, I think the more we can arm non-technical people with confidence to play with these no code solutions, like, you know, like we see or learn about on MakerPad or Product Hunt or whatever, the more that they can do the basic things themselves, the more that they, they get more interested in the more complex, right? So, you know, one of the things that I, I love about you and what you think is you sort of break things down into like these little atoms or these little kind of pieces of code that you use, right? So you and I were yeah. talking about this last week of like, all right, how do we like have to get something, you know, pretty quickly? And you're like, oh, no problem. I have these five little micro libraries that I can just bring together. Yeah. So I love that about the way you think. And I just, I want to encourage anybody that's listening to it to really find, find the meaning in the thing, because sometimes it's so easy to get lost in the craft of making the thing. Um, yeah. And I hope that's not too meta for some other folks listening. Well, have you ever, have you ever done story driven development where you make the three by five cards of a user logs in and they click on that and then this happens, you know, and then set that aside and then the next one and you keep doing that that way. And then, you have to do front to back development with that. So you have to like kind of build out the front end of it and then decide what, you know, the database kind of database people like, I actually like building the database first a lot of times. And then I have to go back and do it again. because <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the foundation of the house isn't where I wanted it. And I didn't make that room that I needed. Oops. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. do it again. Um, but yeah. That's it's, interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a challenge, right? Because I think the, to one of Corey's questions earlier, I feel like there's, you know, your metaphor of like chaining the person to the machine was interesting. I, I believe, and just, you know, I, I've sort of wielded it in certain meetings as, as a, um, as a sword in some cases where it's like, if you understand tech and you understand people who don't understand tech and you can sort of bridge the gap, you be, you basically become this like demigod in some ways. Right. Whereas like the thing I think that is the, the hardest thing to do is to, to disarm someone. Right. Because naturally, you know, humans have a tendency from what I've seen, like if you're in a room with an executive and they don't understand any of the stuff you're talking about, mm -hmm. they feel stupid and ego kicks in and then they shut down instantly versus yep. like, if you understand like the thing that they care about, I always explain this idea of like, if they're really like high level, like a board of directors member or C-suite, I was on a board call today, yep. they want to speak in big picture generalities, abstract concepts. But then if you understand that there's someone in the room that you actually have to get to that concrete concept, right? Like, you know, in, the, in this case, we were talking actually about a database problem that is going to require real code and not just something that can be done in a day or two. But I had to work my way through that hierarchy. I had to start really abstract yeah. and then get concrete. So it was like, it was like a five minute thing to get there. But once I got there, ultimately we ended up making progress. But if I started with, 
the database or the thing they were trying to do, oh, I had no shot in hell of getting yeah. them to let their guard down. Well, and this is one of the things that's funny. I frequently will not, it's not like I, I rack my brain trying to find the right metaphor. I trust my unconscious mind, or I trust my right hemisphere that it knows and that if I ask it a question and then I turn my attention to something else and then I go try to be as dumb as I can, that it will not let go of that problem and then it'll just spit out the right answer for me in maybe a half hour or 45 minutes, right? Um, I've done a bunch of weird things. I remember once when, so I was working for the, you know, with a group that was working for like Bill Gates Foundation and the World Health Organization doing, you know, vaccines. Um, and trying to get vaccines into just impoverished places where you know, we had a vaccine that could save you know 100,000 people a year from rotavirus, but their Merck didn't have a reason to to build the factory to get it there, so we had to ask Bill Gates to build them the factory. Um, but again, you're kind of pitching this thing: Hey, Bill Gates, do you want to? If you put the small money here, then you'll save this many people's lives. You put the bigger money here, you'll save this many. If you want the large package, you know, it was small, medium, large. And so, like, what will? Well, what's the? What's a good narrative for that? And what's a good metaphor for that? And the one that I came up with because it was, you know, this was October, September, October. Um, by the time they were into it, it was October, November. And I said, look, think about think about it not just small, medium, large. Think about it like Halloween. Thanksgiving and Santa Claus or Christmas, right? And I said, do you want to have the Grim Reaper where a lot of people die? Do you want to have, that's, it's, it, that's symbolic of the harvest being too little. You know, do you want to have just enough, which is yes, we're gracious and thankful. Thank you so much for this, which is Thanksgiving. Or do you want to have the, uh, the abundant harvest, which is, you know, they get this fat guy running around, you know, and that's, that's Santa Claus, you know, but the thing that's funny is that the ancient Romans had a holiday the same time as Christmas and it was this they did this weird thing they would worship this god named saturn and the way they thought to do it was like they would go outside and they cut down a tree and then they drag it in their house and decorate it <laughs> it was weird um but anyway so because he was a harvest god right but the thing was that he was the grim reaper but he was also santa claus because if the harvest was bad then he was the grim reaper he was a skeleton and if it was great he was a big fat guy you know and so but the point was is that you know by turning it into that you know uh bill gates foundation sprung for the for the Santa Claus package, because of course they want to, it's Christmas time. You want to be, you want to be the Halloween guy? I can't be the Halloween guy. You know, that was a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> you know, like, so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting on, on that. If you really kind of like learn to use your own um, operating system and your own things and say, Hey, I need, I need a metaphor that's like this, you know, you might have a couple of iterations of it where you're thinking you get stuck in Goldilocks for a little while and, you know, <laughs> the, the too hot, too cold, just right thing. But probably. No, that's awesome. It's kind of like, I think about it a lot. Like I always use the either three or five when I'm doing like this, like a, it's like a, a SAS landing page where it's like good, better, best or whatever. So I'll use like three or five different options. Yeah. Um, but the way that you just, uh, you just took, took that concept to another level, you know, I'm thinking about with my team now, like uh, the, the next decks that we build for like a pitch or something are going to be on a different level of Epic. So um, people are going to be wondering like, where the hell we got all this inspiration from? So with that, um, I think it's a really good place for us to break. Um, Richard, thank you so much. Be before I let you go, um, where can the audience kind of check out the stuff that you're talking about and thinking about? Like, where do we go online to just like to follow you and just stay in touch? Um, yeah, I've, I've, I'm, 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 I'm in places online, but I have to go and like consolidate my, my storytelling. You know, I, like I said, I've been doing AI stuff for two years, basically straight. And now it's kind of like, all right, let's get back into the, doing the mixture between the two of them. Cause I feel like I've gotten a good enough handle on AI that I'm like, all right, you know, I can, I can swing that. Um, there's, there's some lectures I did that are online. Um, there's a TEDx talk, but they messed up my slides at the beginning and I got kind of a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit too uh, embarrassed there and stuttered and all but so the beginning's not very good but the rest of it's all right um and then i've got a couple other um talks and such but i would recommend a couple of, i would I, to be honest i'd recommend other people <laughs> like i know a lot of people that are really good at this stuff that i've kind of followed for a while um there's a guy named michael mead who's out of seattle uh with a group called mosaic voices and his um he's just a masterful storyteller and it, I mean he's not very tech minded but he's very much really looking at the modern pol political event sphere and trying to find the, the narrative behind it um, you can find a lot of people uh, like that that are out there 
Um, the other one is Clarissa Pinkola Estes. She's the author of Women Who Run With the Wolves. And she's, oh, yeah, yeah. she's got a phenomenally poetic uh, take on things and she's very, uh, very brilliant on, on that. But even, even a lot of like, you know, fairly like notable authors have a good grasp on this stuff. Um, one of the ones that I spoke with once was um, uh, Margaret Atwood. So yeah. Margaret, yeah, Margaret Atwood was really fun to talk to. Um, and she's just, just, you know, just all over the place with this stuff. And she's just, it's like, you know, it's her bread, her bread and butter. She just gets it right. The thing that's funny with her is that she kept, anytime she could, she would, she would, um, upend the conversation and try to start, start talking about like 1950s horror movies that were really bad, where you could see the guy pushing the floating eyeball on the cart, you know, like you could see the stage hand, <laughs> you know, she, she just started talking about that. It was amazing. But, um, but yeah, so there's, there's things, but, and people can reach out to me directly if they want to, you know, talk more. I mean, I'm happy to jump on Zoom. Sounds good. For thing. Yeah. It, and I mean, just for everybody checking this out now or in the future, uh, start to jump in, Richard, just, um, guys, feel free to shoot me a tweet on Twitter or, you know, hit me up directly. Um, and I'll get you guys connected to Richard. This way we're not blasting his email address, uh, wild on the internet. So, uh, mm -hmm. I'll get you guys all connected, but Richard, thanks so much. Um, with that. I'm going to let you go and I will be in touch and I'll catch up with you on Think Forward. Cool. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks, guys.